I'm going to talk to you today about what it is that makes people, groups, individuals, societies, nations, able to respond to the effects of climate change, so adaptive capacity. And of course, this work is going to be motivated by the issues of climate change, right? Global climate change is real. I now live and work in DC, so this is something I occasionally have to assert at the beginning of talks. Climate change is happening. It's happening at an unprecedented level, which means that it's really creating new challenges or challenges that are worse than we've seen before. So we have to come up with some new ways to deal with it. And as we've seen with the recent storms, uh, the hurricanes, we're really seeing this hit with more disasters and worse disasters than we've seen before. But it's not just hurricanes, of course, it's also the wildfires and the sea level rise and the droughts and the melting ice, things that people throughout EIPA are studying in a range of different ways. So my question is sort of, okay, climate change is happening, but what do we do about it, right? Um, and there's two real big approaches to this. Of course, there's mitigation, right? We should stop climate change from happening. We should stop doing the things that are causing these problems. We should reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a huge area of inquiry on its own. And the second approach, though, is to say, some part of climate change is going to happen even if we mitigate. Even if we all went greenhouse gas neutral tomorrow, we quit cold turkey, the system still would be changing and still would have effects of climate change. So we still need to consider what we do about that. And this part's going to be the adaptation component where we decide how do we respond to and prepare for those effects, those challenges. And this is the part that I'm really interested in. How do we respond after the fact? And I want you to imagine your hometown or any community, right, that is dealing with multiple effects of climate change. It might be increased heat waves from global warming. It might be rising sea levels and storms. It might be health increases and different disease vectors. It might be increased flooding and rain or less flooding and more drought. Now, you want to help your hometown deal with climate change. So what do you do? Right? And this is a huge problem. And there's so many places. So where do you start? How do you even think about making your hometown better adapted to climate change? Um, adaptation science the sort of emerging field around climate adaptation and about how we think about these problems can be roughly divided, I'm going to divide it roughly, into two areas. So we have this sort of whether these innovations, whether particular adaptations are effective, right? whether this thing that you're trying works or not. And then the second part is what makes you likely to even try to do something? Right? What motivates you to try to address this problem? And what do you need in order to implement those different solutions? And so roughly, I'm going to take those and they're color coded according to we have these adaptation actions. If your community is at risk from flood, you could build a flood wall. That would be an adaptation. And it would be an immediate, assuming you built the flood wall correctly, it would be an immediate benefit, right? It would reduce the risk of flood. On the other hand, if sea level continues to rise for the next 50, 100 years, that flood wall might not work in 20 years. It might be too low. It might disintegrate. You might have to do something new. Do you then have the ability to build a new wall? Right? Do you have the ability to build a higher wall, to do something different? And this gets into that second component about adaptive capacity. What is your ability, either as a person or a community, to engage in continuing and ongoing adaptation? And the fish pictures are, of course, from the old adage, right? Do you give a man a fish or do you teach him how to fish? And teaching how to fish has the very long-term benefits, but it also has a problem in that it doesn't necessarily have short-term solutions. If you're very hungry and I offer to teach you how to fish, you might be a little frustrated with me. Similarly, if you're at major flood risk and I come in and tell you I'm going to improve your governance structures, you might say, but the water, <laughs> right? There's a problem I need to address now. And so neither one of these is going to be entirely useful on its own. There's going to have to be some combination. But I'm interested in adaptive capacity. And one of the reasons I'm interested in adaptive capacity is because climate is changing. This is actually one of the things an adaptation practitioner during my case study love to use this phrase and emphasize the ing, right? It is ongoing changing. It is not one change and then we stop. It is a continual process. And so you have a temperature or a sea level rise or some factor that is, has a trend and it has some variability, right? It goes up and down on an annual or a daily or whatever basis. And we're able to deal with some amount of it. Some amount of flooding occurs and it's not a problem. But when that flooding gets too high, right, we have a problem. We have damage or we have major disasters. And if there's too little water, of course, we have a drought. There's a problem there. And if we get a lot of disasters, ideally, we will respond. We will do something to deal with that problem, right? And we will adapt. And then if this continues, we will have to adapt again and again and again as these continue. 
And so the ability to do that adaptation over and over, that's the adaptive capacity that I'm interested in. Other people are working on how well that adaptation works, what makes it be this big as opposed to very big, and how we implement those. But I'm interested in what makes us able to, to do that at all. So going back to our community, <clears throat> if I told you, great, the answer is we're going to build the adaptive capacity of this community. This still begs a lot of questions, right? <clears throat> what is adaptive capacity? How do we measure it? And how do we build it? And these are answers, these are questions that we don't really have. Yet. We have a lot of research on adaptive capacity. Some of the earliest papers I'm able to find with adaptive capacity in the title are actually from the 1940s. They're businesses that are trying to respond to changing social conditions following World War II. And so they're adapting to a new social stance. And then in the 1980s, we start getting some biology, looking at how plants are adapting to change and engineering systems responding. And then we get this blue jump. And this is the geography. These are the people who are looking at how people respond to climate change or to drought or to other environmental hazards and changes in their system. Uh, and you can see it takes off right around here. Uh, this is when the 2001 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change included adaptive capacity as one of the components of vulnerability to climate change. And a number of papers started growing off taking that vulnerability to climate change and using it. Someone's unmuted. Stop. Stop talking. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. My family is on video conference. <laughs> So, stop, stop, good, <laughs> okay, <laughs> ah, good. <laughs> so we have a lot of research that's happening on adaptive capacity. But, and this is happening in a range of different disciplines. So when I took a sample of 275 papers that have adaptive capacity in the title, and I coded the first four authors on each paper according to the discipline that they affiliated with, that they listed as their affiliation. I get this pie chart. And this pie chart has so many different disciplines in it, right? Uh, and some of them, you'll note, are, are interdisciplinary in themselves. So sustainability, sort of an interdisciplinary inquiry on its own, right? But listed as part of this. Or geography, interdisciplinary. And as people in this program know, maybe better than anyone else, interdisciplinary has benefits. You get a lot of new insights and methods. But it also has challenges. People. All right, you're done. <laughs> Sorry, got to fix this. <laughs> I'm trying to end this. Go away. You do not get to be. I've muted my. I've muted mine. I've muted them. Stop share. Who is talking? <laughs> there should be a little thing next to the right side. OK, they're muted. Good. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I, thought I'd, I thought I'd addressed every technical contingency. <clears throat> <sighs> of course I did not. This means the rest of it smoothly, though, right? Um, so interdisciplinarity has challenges, <laughs> like having your family on the phone call. Um, so. One of the big challenges that comes out of this is how do you synthesize lessons, right? How do you take lessons from the engineers and from the sustainability people, from the political scientists, from the ecologists, and get them to talk to one another, right? And one of the biggest challenges of this is out of these 275 studies on adaptive capacity, more than half of them have never been cited by anyone, right? Which means that at least half of these insights just aren't getting used, right? No one's reading them. Maybe they're in the wrong journal. Maybe it's on adaptive capacity, but it's an ecology journal, so the engineers are never reading it, right? How do you take all of these different pieces and put them together? Further complicating this, that range of papers covers a huge range of topics, right? We get urban planning, we get hazards, we get water, drought, forestry, agriculture. So again, these break down into subsections. And there's a question of how we're, are we learning lessons from the drought for the agriculture, right? Or for the flood and for the water resources. We also cover a range of social scales. So everything from an individual household to an international region, like Southeast Asia. Right? And so what lessons can we take that might apply at the household, institutional, and international level? So my dissertation, the hope of my dissertation is to address those three questions that we don't know by 
developing new ways to define, assess, and apply the concept of adaptive capacity. Today, I'm only going to talk about the assessment piece, because that's where I feel I'm using the most interesting methods, hopefully, to provide new synthesis to address some of those challenges in the field. How can we take all of those different pieces and try to come out with something coherent from that? My caveat is that in doing this, I will very likely raise a lot more questions than I provide answers. One caveat is because I am studying what the field says, at the end of the day, all I can really claim is this is what the field says. Now, I can claim that this is the field as a whole and what it synthesizes. And ideally, in doing that synthesis, I will come up with new directions and new types of questions. So we'll be asking questions that are new for the field, and we'll be pushing this forward. But I won't be able to say that this is the answer and this is the way it definitely is in the world. That will have to be done by testing the questions and the hypotheses that I come up with. The way adaptive capacity has been studied, mostly to date, falls into one of three categories. Out of my 275 papers, where 121 are sort of descriptive case studies, very often qualitative, individual, often single case studies, sometimes multiple case studies, but that are not really comparing. They're just multiple cases being analyzed. Um, then we have indicator-based frameworks, where people take a list of factors that they think matter to address climate change, and they score them, either quantitatively with a number or qualitatively red, yellow, green, or high, medium, low, and then aggregate to some score, often yellow, right? And then we have the last one, which is a comparison to disaster outcomes. So someone goes in and they take, say, the same list of factors, and they compare, well, how do these compare to mortality rates in a nation due to hurricanes? And they use that to try to understand which of these factors matter. So these are the three general approaches. As an example of what I'm talking about, we have this case by Goldman and Rios Mina looking at Tanz and their response to the 2009 drought. They take two communities, they go in, they do 148 household interviews, and they do ethnographic observations, where they ask about household characteristics. Is there a male or female head of house? How wealthy is the household? How many children does it have? And then ask about their coping strategies to deal with the drought. Did you go to new pasture? Did you buy extra feed? Did you sell off your cattle? What did you do? And they compare that to how many cattle people lost. One of their major findings is that selling off cattle and paying for pasture for the remaining cattle is a successful coping strategy. So this is sort of I'm using as an example of a, a typical adaptation or adaptive capacity study. This is the type of work. And although the results have numbers, right, 30% to lower loss in cattle, most of the results are written up in a qualitative and descriptive manner. There's an ethnographic section that describes individual households and their strategies and how they approach this, which of course further complicates any options to do a meta-analysis, right? You can't go in and compare 32% loss of cattle to another community that looks at X dollars of loss in a flood, or that becomes challenging. So what I'm trying to do is I don't want to just understand what factors matter. We have a lot of papers, like the Goldman is Rios Mina, that say these are factors that matter. These are the determinants of adaptive capacity, because they determine how adaptive you can be. And we know that some factors go in, Right? And then we get some capacity out. And you have high, medium, or low capacity, or you have 32% loss. But what we don't know is how those factors are interacting to actually create that adaptive capacity. Why does insurance make people more adaptive? Why does education make people more adaptive? How are insurance and education interacting to make people more adaptive? How is that creating risk awareness and risk tolerance? So there's sort of this black box that we don't know. But what we do have is we have 275 papers that are studying adaptive capacity of social groups. And each one of those papers is going to give us a glimpse. Each one of those papers is going to say, using financial resources to act pasture is one mechanism. Right? And another one is going to say, insurance matters because it reduces risk exposure. Right? And each one is going to give us a glimpse into that black box. So that if we can put them together in a coherent way, we can start synthesizing and come up with a model of what we think is happening in that black box, of how all those various factors are interacting in order to create adaptive capacity. So this is my goal, how to do this. So my key questions to sort of walk through this, I'm going to look at what are the factors that go into that black box? How do those factors interact? What are their mechanisms and their roles when they're interacting? Do some of them play the same role, or do they all have different, unique characteristics? Are they all critical, or can some of them compensate for one another? Uh, and this is a theoretical divide in the, in the literature that I'll get back to later on. 
So of course I start by just finding my papers, right? Web of Science search, find all the papers I can on adaptive capacity. I search for ones that have it in the title because I wanted papers that were very focused on adaptive capacity. And also because step two of my project was for me to read all the papers. <laughs> so we have 275 papers on adaptive capacity that I read, coded for 25 different characteristics, and looked through to figure out what are the determinants that this literature identifies. And in the field as a whole, I come up with a list of 158 determinants. So here are some examples. Um, and cover everything, right? From, well, from credit and income to culture, governance, transparency, gender roles, your religious beliefs, all these different things matter, according to the literature. One of the most straightforward and seemingly small but actually important contributions of this work is just to identify this list. Um, and not only to identify it, but then to go in and I define each of these terms using the good old Oxford English Dictionary, as well as technical sources where necessary. And this is important because some of these terms, for example, collaboration and cooperation, are those the same thing or are those different? In the business management literature, those are very different. And if you're a collaborative governance person, those are different. But it's not clear that every author who's writing down that cooperation matters really means cooperation matters. They might mean that collaboration matters. They might not be aware of the nuance in those terms. And because authors very rarely define their terms, right, it's difficult to tell. And so this is, again, a difficult way to understand and compare across studies. So by simply identifying that this is the universe of 158 things, here's how they're defined, here are examples of indicators that have been used and examples of studies that have used this term, hopefully we can start getting authors to agree on what they're actually measuring when they talk about these determinants. But of course we want to do more. We don't want to just identify the 158, we want to talk about how they're connected and how they work. So the claim that I'm making with my methods, which are somewhat unusual, is that how the determinant terms, how the words are connected in the papers is going to reflect how the concepts are connected in the real world. So, for example, <clears throat> when Tol and Yohi write down that it is important to note that healthcare and education have strong positive correlations with per capita income, that tells me that healthcare and income are somehow related, right? Or that education and income are related. This isn't surprising to anyone who can read, right? Because we all just immediately process that as human readers. And I could take my 275 papers and my 158 determinants and I could start just writing down or marking down every time that they are connected in the literature in those sentences. But of course that becomes very difficult. I would like to graduate someday. And this becomes very problematic if we're dealing with 275 papers. But it becomes even more problematic if we start dealing with the 9,000 papers that have adaptive capacity as a topic rather than as a title term. So to be able to expand this and go further, we need to be able to automate this. And so I'm going to automate this using a tool from the Digital Humanities, um, Stanford Literary Lab. And this is going to be the collocate analysis. And collocate analysis is an automated way to go in and look at two terms, and although it's pronounced collocate, to see if the terms are co-located. <laughs> so these are two words that are co-located next to each other in the text. So for example, the computer goes in and it says, in all of these texts, every 275 texts, every time it sees the word education, it will look 15 words in front of that and 15 words behind that, and it will say, what words do we find that are statistic appear with statistical significance, right? And it will find, for example, healthcare and the word with, right? And the word with, frankly, just isn't very interesting, so we won't worry about that, right? We'll only worry about words that sort of have a concept. We'll worry about other words that are also determinants of adaptive capacity. So we look for those connections. And I use 15 words in advance and 15 words behind because that's about the average length of a sentence. So we're assuming that these two words are showing up in the same sentence, therefore the author is supposing that they have a connection. Now there are two caveats to this. One is that occasionally you get things like lists or tables where words are connected in sequence but don't necessarily have a connection. So by reading through all the papers uh, personally, right, I can note some of those problems. I can also do a random selection of papers where I go through and I look at a random set of connections to go back and see if they were getting these false positives due to lists. And then I can remove out false positives that appear. And then the other thing this doesn't tell me is it doesn't tell me whether the sentence says healthcare is correlated with education or healthcare is not correlated with education. <clears throat> and that is a significant difference. Now, most of these papers, as in most scientific research, report positive results. Um, so most of the time, these people are talking about these things are correlated rather than the absence of, because it's difficult for them to prove the absence of. 
Identifying this is possible with other techniques. And so one place that I hope to go in the future is to do more of that analysis where I can separate out the direction of the connection that's being established, whether it is a positive or negative. But as a starting point, I'm just establishing that there is a connection in the literature between these terms. So this gives us sort of proximity results. Why is that interesting? So we're gonna use education as an example. The field is very clear that education matters. Education level depends on, how, or determines how adaptive you are. But why, right? Who is being educated? What are they learning? What level are they learning it at? Is this basic literacy? Is this engineering degrees? What are we talking about, right? And why? Why does that build adaptive capacity? And you can imagine a long list of ways that education could be a building adaptive capacity, right? It could be increasing your motivation. It could be raising your risk, risk awareness. It could be training engineers to build flood walls or to do climate modeling and risk assessments. Lots of ways. So if I tell you that you're going to help your hometown and education matters, what would you do? Where would you invest? Where would you invest your time and effort? Would you train more, put more girls into primary school to increase literacy? Would you train more engineers at a tertiary level to get PhDs? Would you do science and STEM education in the primary schools to raise risk awareness? Right, these are all options. And if all you know is that education matters, I don't know what you do with that. But when we find our proximity results in the field, we can start seeing what words education is related to. So authors of adaptive capacity discuss education in connection with 31 terms. I'm giving you a subset here of the most frequent ones. And information, which is not the most frequent one, but I'm putting it up there sort of as an exception, which I'll get to. And I divide these into about three categories. So I see roughly three categories of these terms. One is words that are related to building human capital. Words like human capital, words like information, awareness, and knowledge. This is sort of the, what we would expect from education, right? That it has something to do with increasing your skills and increasing your information. What I will note on that level is that education is not actually connected to the word learning. So <laughs> authors don't discuss education as a means of learning, right? Okay, <laughs> maybe that's not so surprising to the students in the room, but it, I think it is surprising <laughs> to a number of people, practitioners working on this field. Secondly, we get this set of terms that are related to civil liberties, entitlement, democracy, right? participation in government. And if we start thinking about this from a literacy perspective, right? a low level baseline literacy and school enrollment population, you can imagine that maybe people who are literate are more able to engage in their government. Maybe they're more able to exercise their rights and to do things that would enable them to be adaptive. And then the third one, it's just this set of socioeconomic status markers. It's related to health services, your occupation, your literacy, your age, your gender, right? And this I find interesting because this suggests that education is not actually increasing your adaptive capacity. It's just a marker for how wealthy you are and that it's actually your wealth and your social status that are enabling you to adapt more. This is further identified by when you look at what terms education is most often grouped with and most tightly grouped with, it shows up in this bubble with these terms, uh, education, gender, literacy, health, income, employment, right? It never appears in the same group with learning, information, knowledge, technology, skills, never. It always ends up in this group. And it is the most central term in that group. We sort of suggest that education is doing something really powerful in the socioeconomic status group. Now, knowing what I just told you, would that change the way that you intervene in this community to build adaptive capacity? I think it might. I think it might suggest that you don't train engineers, but that instead you try to do poverty alleviation, right? If socioeconomic status is really the key and education is just a way of measuring that, that might change the way that you engage in that community. Now again, going back to my original caveat, I can't say that this is the truth, right? I can just say that this is what the field is currently saying. But I think that this raises an interesting hypothesis, right? That this is the field's assumption that we actually need to go out and test in the field to say, like, is this true? Or is this a false assumption, right? Is the connection between education and learning just so obvious that no one ever writes it down? Or do we really not think that that is a mechanism for change? So I think how they're connected in the literature can help us give insights about how they might be connected in the world, right? Understanding what terms education is related to tells us something about what it might be doing to build adaptive capacity. 
but I don't want to have 158. I don't want to tell any nonprofit, here are 158 things that you need to go to this community and do, <laughs> right? I want to find some way of organizing them and under seeing how those come together conceptually. So I'm going to take all my proximity results and put them into a network. And it will look like this, right? So this is my network. So I have my 158 nodes. There's actually 149 here. Nine of them fall off. They don't have enough connections. 149 nodes and about 1,900 connections between them. Right? And then, because we have a network, we can now do social network analysis tests on it and techniques to start interrogating this network and to understand what are the patterns inside this network. And I'm going to talk about two of those methods. And first, I'm going to talk about modularity. So modularity is going to look at this network, and it's going to tell us, great, you have this big network, but are there smaller subgroups within that network that we care about? And going back to this picture, that's what the colors are. Right, and so you can see education over here, and it's with its health, gender, age, income module. It's a group, right, because it's very tightly connected to them. We have a group down here around access with different types of capital and information. We have motivation over here with perceptions, belief, risk obsession. We have a management group. It's very messy when you look at it in the network. You can start running it multiple times, and you can run it at multiple sensitivities. So sort of tell the computer, look for lots of groups, or look for very few groups, right? And if you look for lots of groups, you get these groups. And these words are just illustrating what words go into that group. So motivation has beliefs, motivation, perception, values, and experience all in that group. And when the computer starts looking for fewer groups, it starts combining these groups into larger ones. And sometimes the way that it combines those is actually very interesting. For example, traditional knowledge, some of the words go to this culture group, and some of them go to the learning group. And that makes conceptual sense, right? Traditional knowledge would both inform the way that you learn about it, and it would also inform your cultural approach. I ran most of the analyses that I did at all three different sensitivity levels in order to test whether it mattered, how many groups I asked the computer to find. Um, I won't go into those results here, but basically the answer is it doesn't matter very much. So I'm going to report mostly on this middle level uh, because it takes a approach between too much detail and too little, so we can get at them. So here are my eight groups. I run the modularity analysis 10 times, and so I can see how robust it is. These terms are the ones that match very robustly with one another and fall into these groups. Uh, and I've labeled them primarily according to the most central, the most important term in each group. Uh, occasionally, as for example, socioeconomic status, I labeled it socioeconomic status rather than education despite that, but for the most part, they're labeled after that. Uh, and these are the groups that I'm using to organize my 158 principles. So rather than saying 158 things matter, I can now say, here are eight categories into which those 158 fall, to simplify the way that we approach how we help our community. Um, and I can further organize this by saying that I have five things that I'm calling abilities. These are things that every actor needs to be able to do in order to adapt. Right? You need to be able to motivate, to manage, to access resources, to learn, and to authorize. And how well you're able to do those things is informed by your socioeconomic status, your social networks, and your culture. So this, this divide is the way that I'm organizing those 158 pieces. So now we come to this claim. Determinants in the same module. So those words in the same category, all the terms under access to resources, play the same functional role. They all have a similar role in building adaptive capacity. And they can compensate for one another. So why do I think this is true? Well, in other fields, this has been shown to be true, that when you do a social network analysis and you break it down into groups, pieces in the same group tend to play the same role. They tend to all have the same sort of function within that network. Uh, and this is true in biology. It's true in some of the social network. When you take a network and you do this, this tends to be true. Now, it's not exactly evidence, but it suggests that there might be parallels to this network. Secondly, there's a lot of overlap, right? Just conceptually, when you look at these lists, it makes sense to me conceptually that markets, insurance, wealth, credit, income, savings, and loans aren't really playing totally different roles. They're all somehow at least related, right? They're all about your access to financial resources. Now, there are different means of getting there, right? They have certainly different nuances, and we need to understand those nuances, but at another level, they're very related, right? They're certainly more related than income is to literacy or income is to justice, right? So these ones are being categorized together. And then the third line of evidence for why I think these things 
compensate for one another and why I think they're playing similar roles comes actually from the field. So we return to our gold minus Rios Mina peanut paper, right? Cattle herders in the drought who had financial resources were able to access pasture for their cattle and therefore better able to withstand the drought. Social networks were not important in this paper. But if we looked at Fernandez Jimenez, 2015, they found exactly the opposite, right? That cattle herders in a drought use their social networks to access to additional pasture. Now, if you just give those two results, these seem very contradictory, right? Well, which one is it? Or what context or what matters? And what I'm saying is, actually, it's the ability to access pasture. That's what matters, right? It's whether a cattle herder can access additional pasture. Social networks and financial resources are just two different ways that they might be able to do that, right? They can get pasture through their friends and family or they can do it by buying it. Either way, the real answer is just could they get pasture? So this is um, my last claim here, if I try and tie these all together, is that all eight categories, all five abilities and three conditions are critical, are important. You can't not have one. Um, and for this, I'm going to use the social network analysis of centrality, right? Just measuring how central these, to these nodes are, these words are, into the network. So when I look at this network, the size of the node is actually a betweenness measure. So it's measuring uh, connections. I also did a, a degree measure which measures how many connections these terms have, and they give me the same results. So in this network, the most central nodes are very central. Uh, and just pulling out the most central nodes, these are the top 10%, the 15 most central nodes in the network. So these, according to that analysis, are the most important things. These are the most critical elements in building adaptive capacity. And what I find is interesting is that here are my eight groups and here are my most important terms. And they map on fairly well to one another. Not all the most important terms are in one group or grouped together or clustered. They're spread out fairly evenly. The one exception, of course, being motivation. I don't know why nothing in motivation is critical. <laughs> um, I tend to still think that motivation is actually critical and that this might just be a function of the way the, the network worked. But um, so one of my evidence that all of these groups are critical is that they all, ha all, every group has a most critical term in it. And that suggests to me that they are all actually important. So those are my major claims, right? There's 158 terms. We can look at how they're connected in literature to understand something about how they function. They divide up into these eight groups, five abilities, three capacities. And within the same group, the determinants are playing similar roles, right? And they can compensate for one another. But that all the, all the groups are actually very critical. Now this has implications for our theory and our practice of adaptive capacity. Going back to the question of where do you put your money? How do you invest in your hometown? How do you help your hometown adapt, right? There are two predominant theories in the field right now. One is called weakest link theory. Uh, title sort of explains what it is, but it's the idea that your adaptive capacity is limited by your weakest determinant, right? So here, this adaptive capacity is fairly low because it has a weak determinant. So, if I told you to allocate resources, you should allocate your resources to the weakest element in order to strengthen it, because that would increase your adaptive capacity as a whole. Conversely, we have compensation theory. Compensation theory, as the name might suggest, implies that one can compensate for another. So strength in one element can compensate for weakness in another. So you would want to strengthen the already strong determinant to make sure that it really can compensate for weakness elsewhere. Going back to our cattle, imagine for example, that a person who is very, very rich and has very few friends, right, or a person who has lots of friends and no money might do better than a person who has a little bit of both, right? Because the person who has a little bit of both doesn't have enough money to compete with the really rich person and doesn't have enough friends to compete with the person, the very social person, right? So that person who's kind of in the middle is not as well off as the person who's strong in one and weak in the other. So this is some of the evidence for maybe there's a compensation theory. Now what I'm proposing as a new theory based on the categories that I find is what I'm calling module theory. So you have these modules, you have these groups within the network, right? We have these eight groups. And each of the eight groups I'm claiming is critical, right? So each of the eight groups, if it is weak, will limit the adaptive system as a whole. So if you are allocating your resources, you will want to allocate your resources to the weakest module. But within the module, you might want to allocate your resources not to the weakest element within the module, but to the strongest one within the module in order to enable this compensation. So that's where my additional resources go. 
This blends the weakest link in compensation theory simply by identifying that the determinants are not all separate and equal, but rather divided into these groups wherein they interact. So my assessment through this approach synthesizes the literature across all these different disciplines and pieces, right, to identify the determinants. It creates a conceptual model of how they're working through their interactions, through those proximity results from the co-location analysis. It reconciles a theoretical debate between weakest link and compensation by providing this new module theory idea. The methods themselves are actually a contribution in that they illustrate the ability of computational text analysis to synthesize this kind of interdisciplinary research. Uh, in future, I would like to write, automate this more so I don't have to read all of the papers in a new field <laughs> um, and be able to apply it. For example, apply it to the term resilience and then understand how the model around resilience compares to the model around adaptive capacity. Do they have the same determinants? Do they have different determinants? How does, what characteristics increase resilience? Uh, and I think by comparing those types of models, we can actually learn more about all of those types of concepts. And then in practice, right, this helps us understand when we think certain determinants, when is cash more important than having future income, right, when is having social network more important than having financial resources, it enables us to start thinking about those trade-offs within modules. And it also provides this insight into where would you put your money? Where would you put your time and effort? Would you assign it to the weakest link or to build compensation pathways? I'm going to briefly touch on an application of this using what I'm calling an adaptive capacities framework. And we apply it to the qualitative case study of London that I did. Of course, this begs the question, why another framework? Um, particularly because the adaptive capacity field has 64 indicator-based frameworks already, only one of which has ever been used in a paper outside of the one where it was created. So, <laughs> so we start off with this. But one of the challenges that all of these capacity indicators have is that they're asset based. And this has actually been a critique of the field in general is that adaptive capacity is very asset based in the research so forth. What I mean by asset based is that it measures things like how many phone lines do you have, right? So asset based is do you have a cell phone? Whereas in a functional approach like I want to use, I would ask, are you able to communicate with others, right? You could have a cell phone and no friends, right? You could have a lot of friends and not communicate with them via your cell phone. So there's a big divide between whether you own a cell phone and whether you are actually able to communicate. And conveniently enough, my assessment method has identified eight functional roles <laughs> that help you build adaptive capacity, which we can just reframe as questions. So we ask, instead of saying motivation, we say, are you able to motivate both yourself and others? Are you able to access resources? And not note, not do you have financial resources, but are you able to use whatever you have to gain access to the pasture or to whatever it is that you really need? Are you able to administer it? Are you able to authorize it? Are you a homeowner or a renter, right? Are you able to make the decision that says we should elevate this house, right? I think my landlord would have some problems if I did things. Um, are you able to gain and process information? And then we have these three underlying conditions that are not abilities, but rather they shape your abilities, right? So your socioeconomic status, your culture, and your social networks are gonna shape how well you are able to do those things. We can repackage this into a nicer graphic and call it the adaptive capacities framework. And I'm calling it the adaptive capacities framework because it's a recognition that adaptive capacity is not one capacity. It is actually a buildup of numerous different abilities working together, right? And they all interact. They're not completely divided, right? How well you're able to learn is going to affect how motivated you are and vice versa. If you're extremely motivated, you might need fewer resources because you might find workarounds or other approaches. So they're not going to be completely divided, but they're all going to be important. They're all gonna be critical. So you're gonna have to have all five and they're all gonna be informed by those three underlying conditions. So this is much simpler, right? Instead of 158 determinants, you know how of eight questions that you need to ask when you're approaching this problem of how to adapt. We also get to ask new questions like, how motivated is motivated enough? And is there a limit? Like, is there a maximal motivation? Is there a point at which it just doesn't matter how much more motivated you become, right? Or it just doesn't matter how much more authority you have. So are there threshold limits? I don't know, but we can start asking that question. And then finally, it's scale independent, or at least I'm arguing that it's scale independent. So the frameworks that have been developed to date have been for a household or for an institution or for a nation, but never been able to compare across those different scales. And this raises challenges because we know that there are interactions across scales. We know that how 
adaptive a person is, is going to affect how adaptive their community is, and vice versa. Right? A community with poor governance skills and authority probably will limit the adaptive capacity of the people living in that community. But because we can't assess both at the same time, we have a hard time looking at those interactions. So uh, one of the other projects I did as the dissertation was actually a case study of London. And we tend to think of London as a single scale, as a city. But London is actually a region. It's a regional government made up of 33 local governments. So it has multiple scales within it. And so I went to London in 2014, 2015, and did key informant interviews with government officials, stakeholders, and planners. And what I was actually looking at was how well they had prepared their London climate change adaptation plan. I wanted to know what was the benefit of creating this plan. And what I found that I thought was interesting is that creating the plan actually increased their learning, their motivation, <laughs> their governance, their resources, right? Patterns that I was seeing in the adaptive capacity piece. So I asked, okay, well, how, how would you score London? And I look at here at the regional government. So this is the regional government of London, the government, Greater London Authority. And they have fairly medium high ability to learn, medium high motivation, low authority, because the gov regional government actually has no legal authority to require anyone to do just about anything. So they're very limited in their ability to adapt directly. And then I also looked at how creating the plan changed these elements. So that creating the plan was very good at increasing learning and innovation, and creating the plan did nothing to help their authority. And then I looked at the borough governments, and I asked the same question. Well, OK, this, ha this happened at the regional level. What happened at the borough governments? And because the planning only engaged four out of 33 boroughs, there was actually very little effect of the planning on those boroughs and their adaptive capacity. And when I look across these scales, what I think is interesting is that you end up with the greater, the regional government has very high motivation, but low authority. And conversely, you have a borough government with low motivation and very high legal authority. The boroughs are the ones who can actually implement all of these things, but they're not motivated to do so. And so if you just looked at the regional authority and you just looked and you said, London has an amazing climate change adaptation plan. It's ranked as one of the best plans in the world. You might think, well, actually, they're pretty adaptive. But you'd be missing out that there's this other scale of governance happening that has weaknesses and that it has very particular weaknesses. That yes, local governments have very high authority. Actually, they're getting pretty good management. And they have pretty good funding. But they're missing this one key element of adaptive capacity where they can't adapt. And so this is limiting the capacity of London as a region, as a city, as a whole to engage. So when we return to our community, to our hometown, and we think about the question I posed in the beginning, right? What would you do? Your hometown is facing climate change, what would you do? And the answer for me is you would take this adaptive capacities framework and you would start to identify where are the weak points? Where is my community weakest? Is it the learning? Is it the motivation? Is it the authority? And then you would be able to drill down, potentially using this more detailed piece, right, where you had other groups below it. And you start to be able to drill down into those 158, but just looking at the category then where you were weakest. If you're weak in resources, is it because you don't have savings? Is it because you don't have income? Right, all of those pieces within that. And use this as an organizing framework to start thinking about how you would help your community. My next steps, um, I'm thinking I would like to refine the model, right, to address the challenge of the connection, no connection, to address that. I'd also like to look at how this model of adaptive capacity changes if I explore just the water sector or just the hazard sector or just agriculture, right? Is there a comparison across those? I'm looking very meta, but how could we compare? I want to apply it to larger samples, such as the 9,000 papers that use this as a topic rather than a piece, and see if we still maintain those patterns. Or to other concepts such as resilience, sustainability, vulnerability, right? All those other words that are, are related. Um, I also want to try and test the application of, of the adaptive capacities framework, right? How would this work if I actually went into a community and tried to use it as a tool to help build adaptive capacity? Um, and then test some of the theoretical questions that are coming out of my dissertation, like, is there an upper limit to adaptive capacity, right? And how would you even get at approaching, what kind of data would you need to test that? Claim? And then I'm also starting to get back into research on managed retreat and relocation, which is what I did before the PhD. Um, particularly, I want to use the computational text analysis tool that I've been looking at to start thinking about how you would assess stakeholder goals of relocation. So could you use these kinds of tools uh, to do work where you could look at how different stakeholders in different groups. So for example, do government officials and residents who are relocating see the same goals of relocation? I'm guessing not, but I think that'd be interesting to dig into and to see what they actually see those goals are. Um, and then I'm also very interested in the social equity outcomes of that. How does this affect different populations within it?
open for questions. I could certainly refine more on which terms were most critical, right? I identified top 10%, but instead of just saying these are most critical and others are sort of not, right, I could do a gradation because I actually, you actually get a measure, right, that's individual for each one. So I could do more of a gradation about that and I could say, for example, within each group, how critical are those? And then maybe I could sort of, I don't know, maybe I would sum up the criticality of each group to compare. At some point, though, I become a little skeptical of the importance of the numbers. But I don't want to put too much weight on the idea that one term is 0.67 critical and the other one is 0.65, because I'm just not sure that those numbers have real meaning. Um, but, but there might be ways to dig into that more. That would be interesting. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. So I should caveat, my 275 paper sample does include 30 gray literature publications from, um, I tried to take them from what I consider reputable sources and that were also in Web of Science. So it does include a smaller group. I have not looked at, again, that would be an interesting divide, the same way I want to look at different scales. It would be interesting to see if this model changes, whether I just analyze those 30 versus analyze the larger. Um, it has been interesting, the one framework that's been put out that's not totally asset-based is a gray literature from the World Resources Institute. So there is a slight shift in their way of thinking. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that separation. I've sort of included them in this. But I think there's more to look at and how those differences would play out. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a second part to that. Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely, and this is one that um, particularly what I'd really like to test is I'd really love to test, say, before the IPCC report and after the IPCC report to see how much of the after adopted language of the IPCC report. Um, I'd love to look at how these things change, yeah, from different decades, right, whether there's a, a conceptual shift in it. I'm also really interested in this, another project looking at is actually how people define adaptive capacity, right, the language they use to define it. I'd be very interesting to see how that also shifts over time, right, just the way you define it, because these terms resilience, vulnerability, sustainability, have a tendency to come into the field and then grow a bit in their meaning. And it'd be interesting to see where that happens and how, what directions they're growing. So, so over time is definitely a, another future area that I'd like to dig into. Yeah, uh, so, so the relationship between the two is a little tricky because resilience has multiple meanings on its own. Uh, so you have sort of an engineering and ecological definition of resilience, which is a bounce back, like you have a disaster, and then a system is able to respond or to return to its baseline before that disaster. But then there's a newer, broader understanding of resilience that incorporates being able to change and move forward. And this definition is a little more abstract and a little harder to get at, and I think does overlap. The new definition of resilience, I think, does overlap with adaptive capacity. So personally, I try to use resilience only in the returning back to baseline measure and to use adaptive capacity as the ability to move forward and to change. Um, right now, I think there is overlap between the two, but one of the things I'd like to promote through my research is trying to get terms to be very clear 
defined and very separately defined so that they're not overlapping. I think that would also help us when we measure them if we had very clear understanding of how they're distinct. So, yeah. Hmm. It could. Um, so one thing I find, I, I definitely think that is a problem. Um, for example, I had some trick with the term access in this, right? There's different types of access. You can have access to information and access to resources um, and access to a lot of different things. Um, but in my analysis, I'm treating it as access, and I can then explore. So one thing you can actually do is go in and look at the co-location patterns, and you can see whether you're, you can do like principal component analysis and see how your terms are being divided and see if you are getting sort of multiple concepts of the same term. So that's one way to try and explore that if you think that's happening. A few terms where I thought there was syn synonyms, I went back in and tried to look at. So like collaboration and cooperation, right, went back in and found no, I actually can find like 10 examples of people using the phrase collaboration and cooperation, which makes me think that at least some people are using them differently. I don't know if everyone is, but there's at least some difference there. So it is a challenge. Um, one other way I tried to address that is just by using as many different terms as possible. Right? I thought about my 158 terms, and at some point I thought maybe, maybe there's really only 130, maybe some of these really are synonyms. If I decided if I could find any paper that was using them distinctly, I would separate them out in order to try to avoid that problem. It, but it is it is a challenge with the text, right? When they're using synonyms. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the quality piece is actually, um, it's been interesting in presenting this work other places. I, I often get pushback that I've included too many papers. They can't all be high quality. My response is usually, well, they're peer reviewed, <laughs> which doesn't actually satisfy a lot of people, um, <laughs> but isn't a problem I felt I could address in my dissertation. So, uh, so one way is to only accept papers that are peer reviewed and published, right, or by reputable gray literature and nonprofit sources. Um, the reason I chose the small limit really is so I could read because these terms are so novel, I wasn't comfortable in applying this to a unknown field where I wasn't able to check it with my own rationale. Uh, so I am a little hesitant. Uh, that's one of the reasons I haven't made the next step to how would I apply this to the 9,000 papers or how would I apply this to resilience because I'm not totally sure how to solve that problem of not being able to ground truth it. Um, but that's where I'm trying to get to next. One way to approach it, though, would be just to take a smaller subset, right? Like instead of applying to adaptive capacity as a huge whole, to just take the papers by economists on water resources, right? And you would have a much more homogenous body of literature. And so in some ways, I think you could maybe feel that the patterns coming out of it were more trustworthy because you wouldn't have the complications of other languages and other terminology from other disciplines entering in to complicate that. Um, I wanted the very broad, so I sort of had to deal with that challenge, but I'm not sure yet how to solve that problem moving forward. So if you have thoughts, let me know. Yeah. Thanks. 
I think there's there's two parts to that. One, one I'll blame on the literature, and one is my fault. Um, so one on the literature is that yeah, there isn't a lot of discussion about the biophysical resources that are available. Um, there's some very little about right. There was pasture in this community. There was less pasture in this community, but that's not discussed as an immediate connection to adaptive capacity. That's like the problem which adaptive capacity will address. So in some ways, literature isn't describing the, act, the, uh, the existence of a natural resource. It is not considered a determinant. That's the challenge that you are overcoming by doing this. The second component of it that, that is, is the limitation of the work is that in some areas where people do talk about those accesses, right? I initially ran this model where I had pasture, water, right? soil, uh, words like that included in my determinant list. But those words get used in so many different ways that it was causing all kinds of problems. Right? Because a lot of times they're talking about water and it might be, oh, there isn't very much water. But then it might just be, water is a big deal in general, right? And there's just lots of use of the word water. And so it, it creates all sorts of false positives. And so in the end, I took out words that were not used very explicitly as determinant. And so I think that that is an area where I'd like to get back into it. And it gets back to that synonym problem of sort of or less synonym problem, but water meaning eight different things, how do you then separate out, I only want to address this use of the word piece in there. So, uh, so I do think there's word, there's area to try and get at that, but yeah. Hopefully this is sort of a first cut, uh, which I can then improve and refine through other things moving forward. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh. I have that figure, and I do not have it in my backup slides. Um, <laughs> so yes, and what was interesting there is that I assigned it by the first author on every paper and where that first author was located, and then by the geography of where the study actually took place. Um, so they're fairly well spread out. There's very few in South America. So Latin America has very little adaptive capacity research going on. Uh, as you might expect, Europeans and Americans tend to do research all over the world, right? Very few other people do research in <laughs> Europe and America, except for Americans and Europeans. Um, but there's a lot of local author. So for example, all of Oceania, the work that's done in, in Australia and New Zealand is done by Australian and New Zealand authors. The work in Asia tends to be done by Asian authors. So there's a lot of local pieces there, and there's a lot of local partnering. Uh, so I tried to look at places that were working somewhere else. I also asked if they were partnering with local authors. Um, the work in Latin America is often done by American and European authors with no local partners. So that was a, a very interesting sort of gap there. Um, but I haven't separated out, say, like the model according to geography. I've just looked at the geography of where things are being studied. Yeah. 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 So. What I'd love to do in that, so in this class we had students in and each student took on a coastal city and looked at that coastal city's climate adaptation plan. And the idea was to sort of use this class, that each student would become an expert in their city's planning process and output. And then that we could collaboratively develop a way to evaluate which plans were good plans and planning processes and which ones were not. Um, this might have been a little ambitious for a quarter long project. Uh, <laughs> we ran into some challenges. But it was really interesting what we did learn out of it. And what we did learn out of it informed my research into the London case study, um, which looked at that. And moving forward, I think what I'd love to have that kind of class do is actually say test the adaptive capacities framework and use that as a way to, to look at this plan, right? To say, did this planning process affect these five categories? How did it affect these five categories, right? As a way to, as a way to at least give the breadth of these are the topics that we need to address, and then we can figure out how to drill down more. Because there is still a lot of work to be done in how to apply that framework. And I think that that kind of project-based class would give a better starting point for those students to, to engage. But then there's still a lot of room to, to do the detail work there. So that's why I'd love to see it applied. So, thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, I'd thank you. Before we finish, I have some thank yous. So um, I was. Uh, <laughs> I've always heard in the Navy you thank the money first. So these are the people who funded my research. Uh, I'm funded by the Morgan Stanford Interdisciplinary Graduate Fellowship at the moment, but I've also been funded by a variety of other researchers and, and foundations. Um, of course, thank you to my amazing committee who has put up with a lot of false starts and a lot of changes in my research, as many of you know, uh, as we talked about. 
Uh, so this has been a really exciting piece for me, and it's been wonderful to be able to explore not only adaptive capacity, but also other pieces. So thank you, Martin, for always making me be rigorous and grounded. Thank you, Pam, for always making me be grounded in the literature and what other people were doing on it. Meg for making being a lawyer fun again. And Mark for explaining to me what I was actually doing. <laughs> um, really appreciate your explanation of statistics. Uh, and to Chris for being the chair, which um, thank you also to a whole range of faculty and other people at Stanford who have really helped make this possible, um, including the EIPER staff, current and past. So thank you all for that. Um, to all my research collaboration partners who have been various and in various geographic locations, uh, from, the, from London to the Philippines to Florida and the Center for Ocean Solutions here. Thank you, of course, to my classmates and especially to my cohort. Uh, you saw a lot of iterations of this over the years, so I hope it was fun to see the final one come out of this. Um, thank you also, of course, to a range of friends, some of whom I hope are still online um, for my sanity, uh, or yes, what remains of that. Um, and finally, to my family, who I hope is still on video camera, and thank you for muting, um, this is your fault. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when a chemist and an English teacher get together, is that their child grows up to try and use computational methods to understand what words mean. So um, to all of you, thank you very much. So. Thank you.